In terms of the learning objectives for this session, uh, well, there are three. Uh, firstly, to summarize the functional relevance and importance of explosive muscle strength. Second, to explain the determinants of explosive muscle strength. And three, to contrast the improvements in function after explosive type and slow type resistance training. So my title this morning is Explosive Muscular Strength, the Functional Importance, Determinants and Training of Rate of Force Development, with particular attention to explosive type versus slow type resistance training. I'd like to start with these three pictures showing different human movement situations. But the thing that these situations have in common is that there is limited time available to produce force and influence the outcome during explosive athletic events when stabilizing joints to prevent injury or stabilizing the whole body following a slip or trip that can lead to a fall, there is limited time available and thus a need to produce force quickly to produce a positive outcome in all these instances. This ability to produce force quickly is known as explosive muscle strength. Understanding the determinants and training of explosive muscle strength may therefore have relevance uh, to improving functional outcomes in all of these situations and actually many more. Here's the overview of the talk. I'm going to start with a brief introduction to what is explosive muscle strength and then explain why does explosive strength matter in terms of its functional importance to real world human movements and situations. I'm then going to go on and talk about the variability and the intrinsic physiological determinants of explosive muscle strength. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll cover the development of explosive strength through training, particularly contrasting explosive type versus slow type resistance training. But to get us started, what is explosive muscle strength? Well, explosive strength is typically defined as the ability to increase muscular force or torque quickly from a low or resting level. To bring this definition to life, it's useful to perhaps consider measurement. And explosive strength is typically measured in an isometrically, perhaps in an isometric dynamometer like this one, which happens to be for the knee flexor muscle group. And you can see the lower leg here is restrained in this immovable cuff or brace, which is in series with the strain gauge that allows us to measure force. And if we have the participant go from complete rest and then contract as fast and as hard as they can with the strain gauge, we can measure the increasing force over time. So this is the increasing force over time during this initial rising phase of contraction, where explosive strength is all about how quickly the participant can increase in force, how quickly force rises during this initial rising phase of contraction. Take specific measurements from this rising curve. Two of the more common ones include force at specific time points, such as force at 100 or 200 milliseconds, or the rate of force development, RFD for short, which is simply the gradient or the slope of this rising curve here measured over consecutive 100 millisecond periods, RFD, 0 to 100 and then RFD 100 to 200 milliseconds here. To give this a, a little more context, if we have the participant continue to contract as hard as they can, then force will rise a little bit further up to a plateau or ceiling level, oscillate around a little bit um, at that plateau, and we can measure the highest instantaneous force, which is the more classic measure of maximum strength. But returning to explosive strength, there are a number of methodological issues which, which are important and have, can have a critical bearing on this measurement, but I'm not particularly going to focus on those today. The main thing is to appreciate that the essence of this measurement is all about how quickly force rises. So having talked about what explosive muscle strength is, why does explosive strength matter? Well, here's the relatively simple theory for its functional relevance. The time to reach maximum strength in human muscles is more than 250 milliseconds, at least if measured isometrically, 
which is actually quite a long time in the context of some human movements. Movement situations where time is, is short include, for example, sprint running where the ground contact time is around 100 milliseconds for high level runners, meaning there's only limited time available to produce force, apply force to the ground and generate forward propulsion. This is an image of the moment when this athlete ruptured their ACL anterior cruciate ligament. It's been found as some nice evidence that these injuries occur within the first 50 milliseconds after ground contact on landing, meaning there's only limited time available for the muscles to stabilize the joints and prevent this injurious type situation and position. And finally, during a slip or trip that can lead to a fall, there's clearly limited time available to stabilize the whole body and prevent that fall. In all of these situations, there is limited time available to develop muscular force and therefore the ability to rapidly develop force, explosive muscle strength would appear to be important. I think this logic is, is fairly clear, um, but it's also worth considering the evidence for this. And there is a growing body of evidence to support this theory that explosive strength does matter in a wide range of human movement situations. Now, it's actually a, a really wide body of literature, so I'm only going to give some uh, fairly surface level snapshots here in the interests of, of timeliness. But briefly, the functional relevance of explosive strength, firstly, in terms of performance. Well, the athletic task that's been studied the most in this regard is that of vertical jump performance. And here it's been found that by a number of studies that isometric explosive strength measures are related to counter movement jump height with an average correlation coefficient of 0.60 across seven different studies. But what's interesting is that these relationships for explosive muscle strength and counter movement jump height are typically stronger than for isometric maximum strength. Considering sprint running performance, well, there's only very limited evidence, but a couple of studies have found explosive strength measures to be correlated with short sprint performance of rugby players, correlation coefficients again in the region of 0.6 something here. But again, interestingly, no relationships have been found between maximum isometric strength and sprint performance. So a couple of summary points on this. Explosive isometric strength may have better functional validity than maximum isometric strength. Although one note of caution is that the low re reliability of explosive strength, especially during the early phase of contraction, say within the first 50 milliseconds of contraction, has been found to have relatively low reliability between session coefficients of variation in the order of 15 to 20%, which may limit the sensitivity and utility of explosive strength measurements, particularly for individual monitoring and uh, pr prediction. Moving on to the functional relevance of explosive strength in relation to injury risk and recovery. In the context of hamstring strain injury, knee flexor rate of torque development was found not to be a risk factor for hamstring strain injury. This was a, a nice study out of, out of Aspatar. But knee flexor rate of torque development was lower after hamstring strain injury. So it's still possible that uh, explosive strength in this situation could uh, have some implications to the high recurrence of this injury uh, following the initial injury. In relation to ACL injury risk, lower rate of force development or explosive strength has been related to landing kinematic risk factors for ACL injury in females. Specifically, lower hip abductor rate of force development has been found to correlate with higher knee valgus angles. This is a known risk factor for ACL injury and lower knee extension rate of force development has also been found to correlate with higher knee flexion angles on landing, again, a known risk factor for ACL injury. Post ACL injury, 
there's quite a bit of evidence for persistent dev deficits in explosive strength of the knee extensors and knee flexors up to two years after ACL reconstruction. And these deficits appear to be greater than for maximum strength. As captured on this diagram, this is the knee extension strength deficit for the injured leg and its percentage deficit compared to the healthy leg. And this is for maximum force or maximum strength at three time points immediately after injury, then at four months post-surgery and six months post-surgery. And this is then for rate of force development as the measure of explosive strength. And we can see that at all three time points, there are larger deficits in explosive strength than in maximum strength after uh, ACL rupture and subsequent re reconstruction. Furthermore, low knee extension rate of force development has been associated with lower self-report whole body physical function after ACL reconstruction. Moving on to the functional relevance of explosive strength for aging. Well, one study looked at what discriminates elderly fast versus slow walkers. And the factor that they found to discriminate most effectively between fast and slow walkers was plantar flexor explosive strength or rate of force development, which was one third lower in slow versus fast older walkers. Whereas what's often hypothesized to be critical to function and mobility of older people, which is muscle size or, or particularly muscle atrophy, didn't discriminate between these groups. Plantar flexor cross-sectional area, quadriceps and hamstrings cross-sectional areas were similar between the groups, whereas explosive strength of the plantar flexors did appear to clearly discriminate the slow from the fast walkers. Lower explosive knee extension strength has also been found to be an independent predictor of physical function, whole body physical function, mobility and locomotion in men, but little less in women within the Baltimore longitudinal study of aging. Lower knee extension explosive strength has also been associated with worsening of physical function, whole body physical function again, over 36 months, three years in knee osteoarthritis patients. One of the issues with aging is, of course, that older people tend to fall over. So there's been some attention to the potential relationship of explosive strength measures with balance and postural stability. A number of studies have found that explosive strength has a significant but relatively weak to modest correlations with various measures of one leg balance, postural sway and postural corrections. So to summarise on why does explosive strength matter and why it might be functionally important? Well, what we've seen, I think, is that there's an extensive evidence that explosive strength is related to functional outcomes in a wide range of different human movement situations. That's, there I've covered the first bullet point, the first part of the talk, and I'm now going to move on to consider the variability and particularly the intrinsic physiological determinants of explosive strength. What influences explosive strength? Here's some data on the variability of explosive strength. This is from 40 young, healthy, untrained participants, males and females. And these are measurements of knee extensor isometric explosive strength taken in this dynamometer as shown here. And these are the uh, data on knee extension force over the first 150 milliseconds of contraction and we can see the rising force time curve here. And this black line is actually mean values and I've shown here also standard deviation. But what I want to highlight is the minimum, the lowest person in this cohort and the maximum, the best person in this cohort to highlight the variability in explosive muscle strength that there is between individuals. Particularly if we look in this early phase of contraction, there is extensive variability such that the lowest person here after 50 milliseconds was scored just 13 newtons 
and the highest person scored 190 newtons. Well, if you crunch the numbers on that, uh, the force at 50 milliseconds here, there's 13 fold variability between the lowest and the highest person. To put that into context, in this same cohort, the variability in maximum strength showed just over twofold variability. So there's really extensive variability in this ab ability to produce force quickly. And if explosive strength is functionally important, as I've presented some evidence that it appears to be, then this variability might also be important. And it would seem really necessary to understand what drives this variability and what is determining this variability in explosive muscle strength between people. And we've spent some time looking at the determinants of explosive muscle strength. Two possible determinants of explosive muscle strength on a, a relatively high level are, on the one hand, neural activation, the ability of the nervous system to activate and switch on muscle. And on the other hand, purely contractile explosive strength, contractile explosive strength, the ability of the contractile apparatus, the muscles itself in isolation to produce force quickly. Just a few words on these ideas and, and measurements. Neural activation can be measured by surface electromyography, EMG, with sensor electrodes placed on the skin over the surface of the muscle. These electrodes, of course, measure the naturally occurring electrical activity within the muscle due to the motor neurons in the nervous system delivering action potentials, electrical impulses to the muscle fibers, which is the stimulus for them to contract. And if we take these measurements during explosive, the explosive phase of contraction, this is quadriceps EMG amplitude during the first 150 milliseconds of contraction. And what we can see here is that activation rises during the initial phase of contraction before plateauing. And actually that is pretty much as high as the activation goes. What I'd like to highlight is at the start of the contraction, the nervous system cannot go instantaneously from rest to full activation. Rather, there is a delay of about 50 milliseconds or so in achieving full activation. Moving on to contractile explosive strength. Well, purely contractile explosive strength can be measured with by generating involuntary contractions that are electrically evoked, that is with an extrinsic electrical st stimulus, supramaximal stimulation, and specifically here with an evoked octet of eight pulses at a really high frequency of 300 hertz. This is the force time recording during an evoked octet contraction, this red line here. And what's really interesting about this stimulation is that it drives the muscle at its maximum possible rate of force development. So we can see the muscle's ultimate ability to produce force quickly. And it can be interesting to contrast this ability of the muscle in isolation in response to this evoked contraction to the voluntary ability of a person. And this is typical data. There's nothing unusual about this data. And what we can see here, this is the voluntary force time curve during the early part of the contraction. And you can see that it rises much more slowly than the muscle's intrinsic ability to produce force quickly. Uh, there's a demonstrable voluntary strength deficit here for the voluntary ability to produce force quickly compared to the muscle's intrinsic ability to produce force quickly. And in large part, that is due to this delay in achieving full activation during a voluntary contraction. Interesting though these observations are, Here's some more quantitative evidence on the importance of neural and contractile determinants of explosive strength. So this is, the, again, the voluntary force time curve and the variability in voluntary force during this rising phase of contraction 
It's this variability that we're trying to understand. In this initial part of the contraction, the first 50 milliseconds here, what we found is that voluntary rate of force development over this period from 0 to 50 milliseconds, voluntary RFD 0 to 50 milliseconds, we found that to be highly correlated with neural activation as assessed with the EMG amplitude during this same period. You can see pretty high correlation coefficient here. But if we then look at this next period from 50 to 100 milliseconds, this is actually the steepest or the fastest rising part of the ex explosive force time curve. In this period, what we found is that voluntary rate of force development from 50 to 100 milliseconds here in this uh, orangey pink period here, we found that to be highly correlated with the intrinsic ability of the muscle to produce force quickly, the contractile evoked ability to produce force quickly. Again, high correlation coefficients here. And then if we look in the late phase of the contraction here at the 150 millisecond time point, what we found is that voluntary force at 150 milliseconds is highly correlated actually with maximum voluntary force or maximum strength. Summarize this a little, what we seem to be seeing here is that the primary determinants of voluntary explosive strength change throughout the rising phase of the contraction. So this is a, a voluntary force time curve. What we've seen is that in this initial 50 milliseconds, the most important determinant is neural activation. That seems to determine the majority of the variance between people in this period. But once uh, neural activation is typically maximal from around 50 milliseconds onwards, such that the muscle is essentially switched on, and the, then the primary determinant shifts to the ability of the contractile machinery, contractile rate of force development measured with an evoked contraction, then appears to become the most important determinant here explaining the majority of the variance in rate of force development during this phase of the contraction. Whereas in the late phase of the rising curve here, the force curve is heading up towards its ultimate ceiling or plateau level, essentially an asymptote defined by maximum strength, and therefore it's logical that the primary determinant here during this phase is actually maximum strength. I'm going to go on and delve more deeply now into what sits behind this effect of maximum strength on late phase explosive strength and what sits behind this effect of neural activation in early phase explosive strength. So starting with maximal strength as a determinant of late phase explosive strength and one uh, logical idea is that this might simply be due to muscle size. And so we've looked at this in this relatively recent study and a couple of others as well actually um, but this was a, a large study 53 healthy recreationally active young men we measured uh, explosive strength in this isometric knee extension dynamometer once again and here we can see uh, the explosive voluntary torque plotted against time during the first 150 milliseconds of contraction we can see mean and standard deviation the minimum, the lowest person, the maximum, the highest person, again, highlighting the variability that there is in explosive strength that we're interested in understanding. First of all, in this study, we correlated simply explosive strength versus maximum strength or the ability to produce maximum voluntary torque. And these are the correlation coefficients between maximum strength and explosive torque measured at different time points. This is at the 50 millisecond time point, 100 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds. This, what we can see here is that an increasing relationship of maximum strength with explosive strength as the explosive contraction progresses. The correlation coefficients progressively become larger and stronger. But what we were more interested in here was whether muscle size and particularly muscle volume might be the explanation for this growing influence of maximum strength 
on explosive strength. So in this study, all of the participants underwent a magnetic resonance imaging scan of the thigh, and you can see an example axial image here through the mid thigh with the femur in the center of the image, the subcutaneous adipose tissue around the outside. And we've manually segmented here uh, the four parts of the quadriceps. And if we do this in every slice all of the way down the thigh, we can measure muscle volume. So we went on to look at the correlation coefficients between um, muscle volume here, again with explosive torque, explosive strength measured at 5100 and 150 milliseconds. And what we seem to have here is a similar pattern with muscle volume increasingly related to explosive strength throughout the contraction. Uh, slightly lower correlation coefficients than for maximum strength. Um, but this would appear to explain most of the uh, uh, influence of, of maximum strength on explosive strength. So I would conclude from this and some other data sets that we have that muscle volume is a key underlying determinant of late phase explosive strength. Moving on to further understand neural activation as a determinant of early phase explosive strength and whether this might be due to motor neuron behavior, which is something we can assess with the contemporary technique of high density EMG decomposition. And this work was done in collaboration with Alessandro Del Vecchio and, uh, and Dario Farina at Imperial College. And this picture diagram uh, just shows a, an overhead view looking down on the on the lower lay in a dorsiflexor isometric dynamometer. So this is the knee and this is the foot, which is restrained in the dynamometer. Uh, and and on, on, on the instruction, the participant tries to contract from rest and essentially pull their toe up towards their knee and dorsiflex as hard as we can. And we can measure their dorsiflexion explosive strength. But the interesting thing in this study is we placed these um, high density grid of, of, of electrodes, 64 electrodes in each of these grids over the tibialis anterior, uh, the largest and, and most functionally important of the dorsiflexor muscles. And the signal that you get from each of these electrodes looks like a standard uh, raw surface EMG signal, which of course is a summative uh, signal uh, of neural activation reflecting uh, the action potentials arriving at many, many muscle fibers beneath that electrode. But if we take these recordings from the grid and, and across 64 different electrodes and we cross compare those signals with some clever algorithms and some cl clever software, it's possible to decompose the signal into its constituent parts. That is the signals coming from the individual motor units. Uh, and we can see some examples here at individual motor units um, with their signals decomposed and we can clearly identify and see the firing of those individual motor units. From the decomposition, we can begin to quantify motor neuron behavior and in particular the recruitment of motor units and the firing of motor units. And in this experiment, we did these measurements during the explosive phase of contraction in order to try and see how these variables related to explosive strength, the ability to produce force quickly. And here are the findings. So this is for firing rate. So this is mean firing rate in pulses per second. Uh, and this is a scatter plot with the 20 participants in this study. And this is force at the 100 millisecond time point. So how much force they could produce after 100 milliseconds of contraction and what you notice here is there's a really pretty strong correlation between explosive strength and firing rate. And this is for the speed of recruitment. So this is motor units recruited per second uh, in relation to, again, explosive strength measured as force at 100 milliseconds. We can see, again, there was a significant correlation, not clearly not as strong as for firing rate, though. So in conclusion, motor neuron behavior, especially firing rate, but also speed of recruitment, explains the importance of neural activation in determining early phase explosive strength. 
To summarise where we've got to in terms of the determinants of explosive strength. So explosive strength, that's the outcome we've been trying to understand. And uh, this is influenced by actually quite a, a range of things, but I've been focusing on the intrinsic factors, that is the factors within the human body. Uh, and the main categories of those are neural activation, contractile and muscular factors, as well as tendon and, and joint mechanics. And from the evidence we've seen, we can, we can begin to populate the specific factors or specific determinants of explosive strength. We've seen that agonist activation and in particular recruitment and firing rate are particularly important for early phase explosive strength, whereas muscle size appears more important for late phase explosive strength. These are major determinants. Whereas more minor determinants, and I haven't really had chance to uh, to go into those in any detail, but more minor determinants include things like antagonist coactivation, muscle architecture, uh, and the moment arm of the muscle tendon unit around the joint. In terms of some factors that we've found in our work, at least, not to have a measurable relationship with explosive strength, perhaps surprisingly, fiber type composition, as well as tendon stiffness. It's also useful to be aware that alongside these intrinsic factors, there are also extrinsic mechanical factors to do with the task, the event, exercise or mechanical situation that also affect the expression of explosive strength. And that includes factors such as muscle group, uh, velocity and type of contraction, say isometric, eccentric, concentric, as well as uh, slightly less variable joint position and range of motion. Overall, this diagram I think illustrates the multifactorial and integrative nature of the science of explosive strength, whereby these factors, and likely several others that, that we struggle to, to measure and understand at present, interact and combine to determine the expression of explosive strength in any given task or exercise. So I've now covered the second uh, section of the talk and I'm going to move on to the final part, which is the development of explosive strength through training. Uh, and then I will, after a, a bit of introduction, concentrate on this comparison or contrast of explosive type versus slow type resistance training. But to introduce this a little bit, I think it's useful to take something of a historical perspective. So I'm going to begin by looking at some force time curves before and after conventional resistance training, where the primary goal was to increase maximum strength. So this first data comes from Alf Thorstensen back in 1976. This was an eight week intervention training period of some pretty heavy squatting as well as some jump exercises. And they took measurements pre and post the training period in this type of isometric leg press dynamometer. And here are the force time recordings pre or before and then after training. And what we can see is a clear increase in the plateau level of force, maximum strength. Uh, appears to be something of an increase in late phase explosive strength, but in the early phase of contraction, the two lines are right on top of each other. So there doesn't seem to have been any changes here. If we jump forward a further nine years, this is from K. O'Hakinen in 1985. This was from a much longer 24 week intervention of some really pretty heavy squatting exercise. They took measurements again with this uh, isometric leg press apparatus. These are force time curves pre training and then after 12 weeks and once more after 24 weeks of training. And we see a very similar pattern here to the study from Alf Thorstensen, an increase in maximum or plateau level strength, late phase explosive strength seems to have gone up, Le early phase explosive strength, not much seems to have happened here. But if we jump forward another 17 years, this is from Per Ergard and colleagues, they presented some evidence that perhaps 
conventional strength training can increase early phase explosive strength after all. This was a 14 week intervention um, with some pretty intensive quadriceps loading. And they took measurements pre and post the training in this type of knee extension dynamometer. They found maximum strength to increase by 17 percent. But the, cha the changes in explosive strength are captured by this diagram. This is the moment of force about the knee joint against time and the curve pre-training and then post-training. In this study, they found improvements in explosive strength here, 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 essentially all of the way up the rising force time curve. However, a follow-up study from the same group, so this is Lars Anderson, Peregod and colleagues, with an identical 14-week training program where they took measurements pre and post again with exactly the same isometric knee extension dynamometer. Very similar changes in maximum strength, 18% compared to the 17% in the earlier study. However, here the changes in explosive strength were quite different. The data is displayed somewhat differently. This is rate of force development measured from the onset or the start of the contraction to every 10 milliseconds up the rising curve, pre and then post training. And what you can see is these pre and post RFD lines are right on top of each other. Essentially, there was no change in explosive strength throughout almost all of the rising curve until we go right up here to the 250 millisecond time point, which when you look uh, these actual force time curves of 250 milliseconds is pretty much on the plateau of the contraction. So there seem to be some contradictory findings here, even from the same research group and, and certainly between research groups. So where does this leave us? Can conventional resistance training increase explosive strength after all or not? Uh, to give an overview of findings to try and answer that question, I've gathered together here a table these are all studies of young adults lifting heavy loads and with measurements throughout the force time curve. So the references are here, four studies that I've just highlighted, plus, plus two others from the neuromuscular lab at Loughborough that we've done. Some details on the training and then the explosive strength, the test exercise. Um, but what I particularly like to highlight are the changes in early phase explosive strength that is changes from pre to post training, and then the changes in late phase explosive strength. I think if we look across these studies, here for the early phase, well, four showed no change, one went down, one went up. Overall, nothing clearly happening. It seems to stay about the same. And even for the late phase, three went up, one question mark, two stayed the same. So, Conclusion from this table seems to be that there's no change in early phase, possible increase in late phase explosive strength, but certainly some contradictory findings across the literature. So it's perhaps interesting to just reflect on uh, the methodology of these studies a little bit. Uh, here's some methodological queries. In these studies, it's typically unclear if the explosive or rising phase of contraction was deliberately trained or practiced, which relates both to the instructions given to the participants, as well as whether there was a decrease in contractile force between contractions, which might be necessary in order to facilitate training and practice of the explosive or rising phase during the next or subsequent contraction. Transference of strength gains between the training and testing exercise could also potentially have confounded these studies. And finally, typically, these studies had no control group. But the main finding here is it's somewhat ambiguous whether conventional strength training can increase explosive strength. So that begs the question of how best to improve explosive strength. Well, here's some evidence on the effects of deliberate focused explosive type training. This is K. O. Hakkinen again from 1985. This was a 24 week intervention of explosive jump and plyometric exercises 
with measurements pre and post training, once again with this isometric leg press dynamometer. So these are force, time, curves pre, and then after 12 and 24 weeks of training, and we can see a clear shift of the whole curve to the left. That is improvements in force throughout the entire rising curve, early, late, and on the plateau phase of contraction. And in fact, there are a number of studies that show evidence that more focused, deliberate, explosive type training appears to enhance explosive strength and rate of force development throughout the early and late phases of contraction. So based on this evidence, we were keen to do a direct comparison, comparing explosive versus slow type resistance training and looking at the effects on explosive muscle strength in particular. This study involved previously untrained young men performing isometric resistance training of the knee extensors. And the training here was done in this isometric knee extension dynamometer, deliberately so, as this allowed us to control and precisely monitor every contraction performed during training in a way that is simply not possible during free weights or isoinertial contractions. Participants perform one of two types of training, either explosive type training, which involved each training session having 40 contractions of approximately one session, one second duration, producing force rapidly from rest up to 75 to 90 percent of maximum force and then immediately relax. And we can see the force time recordings during this type of contraction, very short, sharp contractions, maximum rate of force development as explosive as possible up to a high level of force, then immediately relax. Whereas the slow type training, each training session here involved 40 sustained contractions at 75% of maximum voluntary force, but with no emphasis on contracting quickly. And you can see the force time recordings here, which are very different from the explosive training. Relatively slow rate of force development, but then the contractions are sustained and held at this high level of force for several seconds. In this study, pre and post, we took measurements of maximum and explosive strength in this same isometric knee extension dynamometer. That is the same dynamometer used for the training in order to deliberately avoid any transference issues between the training and the testing modalities. And here's what we found in this study. This is the change in maximum strength, change in maximum voluntary force, both groups increased maximum strength. Even the short, sharp, explosive contraction produced an 11% improvement. But the conventional slow type strength training produced significantly greater increase of 21%. For the change in explosive strength, this is after the slow type training. This is force, time, curves, pre and then post training. You can see the two lines are right on top of each other because there were no changes in explosive strength after the slow type training. Whereas after the explosive type training, these are forced time curves pre and then post the explosive type training, we can see clear increases in explosive force at all time points of the rising curve after this type of training. Subsequently, there were some between group uh, significant effects uh, and explosive strength within this study. And overall here, what we seem to see are some interesting training specificity effects where the slow type training was best for increasing maximum strength and the explosive type training best for improving explosive strength. So we were therefore keen to follow this up with a larger, more rigorous study, once again, considering training specificity and contrasting explosive versus slow type resistance training, but this time with a greater emphasis also on underlying mechanisms. So this was previously untrained healthy young men who were randomly assigned to 12 weeks of either explosive contraction training, slow contraction training, or a control group who just did their habitual activity. 
All of the training again was done in an isometric knee extension dynamometer of this type shown here that allowed us to monitor and record every contraction during training. And here you can see talk time recordings during the training for the explosive type training, this really high rate of force development up to a high level of force and then immediately relax with a slow type training a more gradual produ production of force, but then sustained and held for several seconds before relaxing. In this study, we also quantified the training stimuli. This is loading duration, quantified as the time above 65% of maximum torque, which was 10 times higher for this slow type sustained contractions compared to the explosive type training. Whereas peak rate of force development was substantially higher for the explosive type training compared to the slow type training. So two very distinct training stimuli here. We measured the changes in function, maximum and explosive strength pre and post training. And also looked at the underpinning physiology, neuromuscular activation, the contractile properties of the muscle in response to evoked stimulated contractions and hypertrophy with MRI. Here are the changes in maximum strength. This is the change in maximum torque from pre to post training. No change in the control group. Both types of training produce significant improvements in maximum torque, but with larger improvements after the slow type than the explosive type training. In terms of possible mechanisms, this could be due to a change in EMG at maximum torque or hypertrophy muscle growth. In terms of the change in quadriceps EMG from pre to post training, well, there was no change in the control group. Both types of training produced significant improvements in quadriceps EMG and with no significant difference actually between the two training groups. Although qualitatively, you'd have to say that the pattern of these differences seems remarkably similar to these differences. So it is just possible that quadriceps EMG could contribute to the greater maximum strength gains after the slow type training. However, there was more clear evidence from hypertrophy. This is the change in quadriceps volume from pre to post training, no change in the control group, no change actually after the explosive type training, only the slow type training produced significant hypertrophy. So this would appear to be the primary explanation for the uh, greater increase in maximum strength after the slow type training. And here are the changes in explosive strength. So this is the change in explosive torque measured at three time points up the rising curve, 50, 100 and 150 milliseconds. The control group is the black bars, which showed no changes at any time point. The biggest improvements at every time point were for the white bars here, the explosive type training, significantly more than the other two groups here, significantly more than controls here. The gray bars are the slow type training, and this only produced a significant improvement at the late time point, 150 milliseconds compared to controls. These improvements in explosive strength might be due to changes in explosive neural activation or the change in the intrinsic contractile properties of the muscle. In terms of the changes in quadriceps EMG, here shown for overlapping time periods, 0 to 50 milliseconds, 0 to 100 and 0 to 150 milliseconds. The black bars again show the control group, no changes there. The explosive training produced significant increases in quadriceps EMG at every time point and significantly more than the controls at all these time points. Whereas the slow type training only produced an improvement in quadriceps EMG for this longest time period, including the late phase of the contraction. For the change in the intrinsic contractile properties, this was assessed as the time course of the response to an evoked octet and an evoked twitch, essentially the time to peak tension of these two types of contractions. With the controls, there were no changes. 
But with both types of training, both the explosive and slow type training, there were significant increases in the time to peak tension. That is longer or perhaps counterintuitively slower contractile properties after the training. And include for explosive versus slow type resistance training. The functional adaptations to resistance training appear specific to the nature of the training performed. Slow type resistance training was most effective for increasing maximum strength. Explosive type resistance training was most effective for increase, increasing explosive strength. In the short term, slow type resistance training, what you might call conventional or more traditional training, does not appear to improve early phase explosive strength. Whereas explosive type resistance training produced a wider range of strength gains with improvements in all explosive and maximum strength measures. Given the functional importance of explosive strength that I argued for at the beginning of the presentation, explosive type resistance training is recommended as an important component of training and rehabilitation of all individuals. In terms of mechanisms, we've seen some pretty good evidence that neural adaptations were specific to the types of contractions performed and may well underpin the training specificity effects that we've observed. Loading duration appears an important stimulus for hypertrophy, and both types of training induced a, a slowing of the contractile properties of the muscle, which is somewhat counterintuitive. It just remains for me to thank the funders of the work of the Neuromuscular Lab at Loughborough uh, and some of the key collaborators who had a huge uh, influence on the studies that we've done at Loughborough. And thank you for your attention.